So now the designer has to sort of become more of a sort of a jack of all trades and master of none, meaning he has to or she understand distribution and marketing and production and technologies and materials and softwares and uh, uh, price points, um, you know, outside of anthropometrics, ergonomics, aesthetics, all these things. So I realized that the designers like role changed a lot uh, that way. And I find personally when I'm involved in projects and you know when you think about the contract market even the contract market of furniture one has to understand how and what the contract market is about right how, how people use things where these objects are placed what context how do they fit the context all these other issues let alone the durability of something because in in the commercial um, context things have to really be strong. You know, I've designed a lot of hotels around the world, I'm working on a hospital, and I've done a lot of these projects where I started to realize how important it is that things are really, really functional and really durable, right? Um, but at the same time, I can't forget that the, the human in all this has to, has to enjoy these things. It's for others, it's not for myself, right? So design has changed a lot. So a lot of times when I say, okay, contract, uh, uh, pro uh, contract furnishings, I feel like an, uh, a conductor in an orchestra where I have to sort of, let's say, uh, in a harmonious way, bring all those aspects together to end up with something that really is worth also putting into the world. My, my process is very old school in a way, analog. I just draw. And when I draw, I'm not drawing, I'm drawing all the possible criteria at the same time. So I, I'm not putting pencil to paper to think about one thing. I'm putting pencil to paper to I start thinking about immediately production, because I, I love production. And I think when you design something, you also be, have to be smart about making it, being able to be produced at a relatively reasonable cost, etc. You know, if you just make a cool thing on the computer and you send it to a client, and they can't, you know, they find out that the production is costing a fortune, there's too much tooling or this or that, or like many companies too, sometimes they'll just take it and develop it. Next thing you know, it gets to market and it's so overpriced, you know, that it doesn't even ever reach anybody's lives, you know, things like, so when I'm drawing, I'm kind of thinking about all that. How would I make it? What possibly could be the material? What could be the process of the way it's assembled? You know, how would someone sit in it? Shall I make it to move? And so for me, it's, it's very hard to explain this, but it's all like happening at the same time. All the synapses in my brain is, are, is firing to, to uh, come up with a design, let's say. Um, and that's just, you know, and I notice, for example, in my office, younger designers or some interns, they tend to, to because they don't have those experiences and they haven't gone through the rigor of that, they will draw something and then make a rendering, but they haven't at all considered how you're gonna make that thing. And this is what we have now, we have AI now. So AI, you can do some beautiful things, but there's still, you need the intelligence and the knowledge and the experience to know how you would take that beautiful image, but make it reality. And at the beginning of the interview, when I talked about all those things the designer needs to embrace now or understand or orchestrate, that's exactly the point. Now you need to orchestrate that beautiful image if you want to manifest it. So first thing I say is I'm inspired by other mistakes. So when I look at the built environment now, it's a pretty saturated environment of things, right? There's a lot. You have so much choice as a consumer, right? And so many people are producing almost the same thing too. So there's, uh, it's exhaustive in a way. But with that said, it's amazing how few products actually really are worthy of being on the market and not just yet another thing, you know? So, um, you know, you design a chair and it should be relatively comfortable and it should meet the criteria of what the, how that chair would be used. Right? So mistakes, and if you walk around the world or you just move, man, navigate, you realize that we've sort of designed a fairly uncomfortable world and a cluttered one too. So lately in this last, let's say decade now, I find myself becoming more and more a bit of a minimalist. 
Um, and and a lot of, although a lot of people think of me as a, a bit of a maximalist, I never was. I always did things very minimally. It's just that I used a lot of very soft form or I used color or I used pattern in a lot of my work, right? But this was to communicate lots of other things. You know, pattern was about communicating the time in which I live. That's a lot of the patterns I do, sort of a digital pattern. But um, the, 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 the important part here is, is that the, the work itself, like an object today, I think needs to be more reductive. And things need to be more reductive. And we're moving that way anyway. You know, and yesterday in the lecture, somewhat was one of the questions. You know, if we move, we're moving into minimalism, someone said in the audience, what will happen after that? Well, will we react and go to maximalism? Uh, and I don't think so. I think the reduction and the dematerialization that's taking place is due to our technology. And the technology affords us to do, have greater experiences with less. So we're doing a lot in this world, more than we've ever done ever before in the history of humanity, with so much less, right? But having incredible experiences. So that's sort of, or you think about something like behind your head, a television, right? It started out as a very big box and it's gone down and down and down and down, you know, and eventually it'd just be wallpaper or it's projection. So now when I design also furniture and objects, like what I've done for a cushion company, is to do, to really do something much more minimal that uh, doesn't sort of add to, let's say, I hate to use this word, visual pollution, you know, something more pure. But at the same time, that it makes sure that it works well, that it's not just pure for pure sake or simple form for form's sake, that it's really about human living. Right? I think, I, you know, I've, I've, I've struggled with this for, to do, to try when I add something to the world, to have some nuance of originality in it. You know, I know the history of design very, very well, and, and I'm so aware of so many uh, things that were uh, produced. So when I draw, for example, or I'm thinking about an idea, I immediately can almost reference it or know where it's coming from. And then I think sometimes it's too much like something that's already existed. So I don't want to go there. I'm not satisfied. You know, me, I, I push myself constantly. And I have this like uh, almost absurd desire to put original things into the world. But at the same time, I, there's two reasons. One is because there are too many things. So if we're going to put something, we got to do something different, right? Firstly. Uh, second of all, you know, I am original and we are all different. So of course we should have something different to contribute, right? I think, I think that's kind of uh, natural in a way, you know? So if you worked with another designer, you would end up with a very different, hopefully a very different product at the end, right? It's not about having a chair in a museum. It's about that that I touched someone else's life and made them have an experience that they'll never forget and that they'll maybe even go home and realize how banal their home is, you know, and rethink it. I realized why I'm on this earth is to make people's lives better. And then I look back and I go, wow, I chose the right profession because for me, design is for the betterment of society. And that was the original agenda. It was a social act to make a better world. And that's what we're doing with design. My feeling is, is that when, you know, when someone says to you, oh, let's do something timeless. I've had clients say that, right? Or classic. Uh, the tricky part about that is, there's a good chance that that's already then been done. We've already been there. So you say, oh, how can I do something new, but still have some longevity that would be in something. And yet at the same time, nothing is timeless. Everything at some point dates itself constantly, you know, and now even faster than ever because of the, the speed we, we, we live at and the way the world has changed. So uh, it's, it's my intention is if I do something that really works, feels really good, the production is smart, the materials are the right choice. In other words, if I meet all those sort of contemporary criteria, which by the way, have nothing to do with the past, they're all contemporary. If I meet them all, I notice with my the projects I've done, they have a, have a lot of longevity. They stay around a long time. It's when I do the project where I spend too much time thinking form for form's sake or trying to do something for the sake of being original or radical, but yet it wasn't working. You know, 
those things were very short lived, you know. So I, I would say, listen, you, you, if to be a designer in this time, in this this world, you stay away from trend, period, and just do good, smart work. In Canada, like many Nordic Scandinavian countries, and that's because a lot of Scandinavians and uh, Nordic countries came to Canada, immigrated to Canada, were very uh, sensitive to the environment. So, and then my education, undergraduate in Canada, was all about, it's amazing how much we had to understand about polymers, materials, what's safe, what's non-toxic, what's sustainable. So I was brought up with all this. Now imagine I start working years and years and years, and I realized afterwards, when I started working years and years, nobody seemed, with all these companies I was going to, talk about this, care about this. And now all of a sudden, 40 years later, it's the whole world is talking about this. But at the same time, I just want to add to that, a lot of it's just talk. A lot of it is, what do they call it, greenwashing, you know? Is it to take real responsibility that the fabric we put on on a, a piece of upholstery is either 100% recyclable or it's biodegradable. You know, there's a, and, and these, a lot of these materials and new technological materials are out there. So we can embrace them and use them. You know, if you're doing carpeting in a space, is that carpet? Does it have some sort of certification that it's uh, ecological? You know, um, and I, in all my interiors, even now, I've been doing a lot of interiors since 1999. I always made sure that we were on top of all that with my staff, you know, and I, and I always cared about it. And I remember when I cared about it, very few people were even talking about it yet. Aesthetically, when people see my work, the last thing they think I care about is that. Because, you know, we associate sustainability with a muted color. We associate sustainability with beige, with brown, you know, with dark green, because we see it as nature, those colors. But, you know, if you do something very colorful, it doesn't mean it's not 100% responsible. Yeah, you know what I like about hospitality experience versus, let's say, residential or design? Because I never design residence for people, private lives. You know, it's interesting. No one's ever asked me anyway. So no one's knocked on my door and said, hey, will you design my, my house or my apartment? Um, and what I prefer, because residential is, it's a very personal thing. And frankly, honestly, I think I know why I don't design it. Because I think those people need to make that place theirs. You know what I mean? And it's amazing, by the way, how many condos and apartments I go into where they're so not personalized. And I wonder how, where is the person in all this? Whereas in hospitality, it's fun and interesting because you do the opposite. You want to give some sort of feeling and, and immediate reaction or space. You know, when I design conference rooms, we're in a, these are small conference rooms, but I do in a hotel conference rooms. When people walk through that door, I want them to feel alive, you know? You know why? Because they probably, maybe are a little tired, it's 9 a.m., they're gonna eat some donut and a coffee and start some conference. And I wanna like bring some energy and some, some joie de vivre that they feel they are gonna have a great day. And you know, you can do that, and I've learned to do that in many, many ways. It's very sort of subliminal, it's psychological, it's playing with perception. You know, so if you have a space like this and you want to, I don't know, get some some energy and movement, maybe that wall is slight underneath colored glass, some LEDs that are moving around to sort of feel like data and feel like information. And, you know, and so it's, I, those are the things I do, you know, and then I think about the shape of the tables because, you know, these this yeah, corner table, you walk in and that's an obstacle, visual obstacle, because it looks frightening. You see the big corner, hard edge. No, I soften it. Because I say, oh, all day people are gonna sit in a conference room. Look at this chair, it's nice and soft. They need to feel an extension of their body. They need to feel relaxed. They need to feel that the things we have in our lives, I always say, uh, should be uh, objects of bliss, not obstacles that are actually causing us stress. So how do you de-stress people? That's what I love. So when I, you know, I design a hotel, all I can think about really is how am I going to really de-stress people? And a lot of designers, they think de-stressing means to keep everything beige. And No, my game is the opposite. How do I de-stress but inspire? So you go, wow, I love this place. Wow, this is fun. Interior design and there's interior decorating, right? And really anybody with a little taste can decorate. 
you know, it's not a, it's not, I don't think it's a real art form, or I don't think it's really, uh, how can I say, a rigorous profession. Interior design is different, it's a rigorous profession, because what you think about, the first thing you think about when you do interior design should be us. So if I walk in the door and you design a hotel room, for example, does the designer stop and think, I'm going to walk in the door? Is that door handle gonna feel good? Does the door need a door handle? Or can my key just open it? Is the weight of the door? What, so in other words, you start, you know, do I walk in the room and I say, you know, curtains open, like I would with Alexa or, or Google Home or something? No, I've been to thousands of hotels, I never see anybody do any of this. That's design, because what you're doing is you're designing the human experience. If I walk in, I definitely don't want to hit the leg of a chair on my foot, or find that I have to turn the shower on but get wet, you know, trying to turn it on, or not understanding how a light switch works. These things need to be very seamless, and you have to think, okay, let's say I'm designing a micro room, a really small hotel room, how can I make that little room work the best, function the best, feel bigger than it is? You know, how do I play with, with the human psyche or, and, and emotionally or with color or texture or, or to, to bring, to, to shift those? Whereas decorating is, oh, I like that table, I put it there. I like that lamp, I put it there. You know? So they're very, very different professions. And you know what's interesting is very few people talk about this in the world. And I think most of what we're calling interior design is not. It's decoration for decoration's sake.